Lord Jesus, we thank you once again for the opportunity to meet here, to meet together in this online setting. Lord, we thank you that uh, people who have made it in the main through the challenges and we pray for those who haven't that you'll just be with them this morning and uh, reassure them of your presence lord and that whatever happens that this morning will be a special morning we pray for others who may not have been able to join for different reasons we just each one will know your presence with them we ask this in jesus name So um, we're going to start our uh, worship this morning with uh, a very well known, I was going to call it a modern song, it was 1982 so it's not that modern, um, but I think it's a very well known song, There is a Redeemer, uh, a, a lovely song and uh, Johnny and Nimishi are going to lead us in that while I mute myself. <laughs> Just speaking, uh, the last few weeks we've been looking at things of the Holy Spirit. We've just prayed, thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. And uh, we felt we really had an encouragement from the Lord that as we're being asked to stay in, we should stay in looking for more of his Holy Spirit. And in that context of looking at the gifts of the Spirit and um, what in what ways does God want to work through us more powerfully? And um, over the last few weeks, we've looked at a couple of different gifts. Today, we're going to be looking at the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. And Lynn's going to read to us now from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, I'm just going to unmute Lynn. 
this 13 to 19. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you are praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer say amen to your thanksgiving, since they do not know what you are saying? You are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. This is verse 26 to 28. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you as a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation? Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two, or at the most three, should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Thank you, Lynn. I apologise, I've slightly messed up on the um, text that was in the deck compared with this deck text that Lynn read but thank you oh sorry no no it was me not you no need for you to apologize it's me oh. that's uh, it's me that's made the mistake not you so um <laughs> that's uh, that's fine that happens um and um I always remember someone who I really respect saying in a meeting if you make a mistake it's not the end of the world and if you are if it is less and that's something that I try and live by as a, as a way of approaching things so I've made a mistake I'm sorry about that um, and I'm going to move to the and encourage Jan to come and uh, take over and share a little testimony relating to what we're going to be talking about today. Well, shortly after I became a Christian, I was reading about tongues, praying in tongues, and I, I'd seen in the Bible that it said about praying in tongues, but I'd never heard of, heard anybody, uh, so I didn't know what, it, what to expect. Anyway, one day while I was praying by myself in my bedroom, I was praying out loud about a particular situation. And I found that um, I was lost for words. I didn't really know how to pray about this situation. So I asked God to, if he would help me to pray, to know what to pray. And as I was praying, um, some strange sounds, to start with, little baby sounds, little utterances, I think you would call it, I started to say these, these words. And um, like a, a baby learns a language, Gradually, these words became more and more like a language. And um, as I'd never heard anybody pray in tongues, so I, as I say, I didn't know what to expect. But after that, my personal prayer life changed completely. And um, about six months later, um, this was in 1988, the churches, a lot of the churches in rugby, were putting on a, a march for Jesus, which was a Graham Kendrick um, organised thing. And I went along to one of the rehearsals because we had to learn the songs that we were going to sing in this march around rugby. And as I was sat with people from different churches, from all over, Christians from all over rugby, the people around me, as we were singing, started to sing in tongues. And I found I was able to do it as well. And it was such a wonderful experience. Um, so I'm just going to pass back to Jim now. Thank you. So our message today, as I've said, is going to be about uh, carrying on with the gifts of the Spirit and talking particularly about the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation of tongues. We carry on. So, to just to set a bit of a, a recap of to things that we've said before, it's really important to remember 
what was said as, as Paul introduced the, the, the topic of gifts of the Spirit. To each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So um, that every, all of the gifts are something that come from the Holy Spirit and they're for the good of the church and for the good of people outside of the church, to, to empowering the church to touch the world. And he listed uh, in that uh, list of gifts of the Spirit, we remember that we had uh, the prophecy, the word of knowledge, the word of faith, um, other gifts. And then he comes to tongues and the interpretation of tongues. And the general place where people start to look for the, uh, about the gift of tongues is to think about the day of Pentecost and uh, we're going to be celebrating Pentecost in a couple of weeks time May the 31st is uh, Pentecost Sunday this year and on the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit came it said with tongues of fire and that the believers were there and they were praising God and that everybody there heard them praising God in their own tongues and in their own languages and lots of people came to Christ that day. Peter preached a powerful sermon and lots of people came to Christ that day. As I was preparing for today, it really struck me in a way that it hasn't before, that that's the only time we see in scripture of tongues being used in that total outreach situation, an evangelistic situation where people started in tongues, started speaking in tongues and people came to Christ. Um, I'm not sure that we have to prepare for that because the disciples didn't know what to expect that day. And when God moved that way among them, they just automatically did what was required of them and um, people responded. It was a, a, a sovereign move of the Holy Spirit. But um, it's clear from this letter of uh, 1 Corinthians and Paul talking to the church in Corinth that Paul expected speaking in tongues to be part of the worship and prayer life of the church. He himself said he spoke in tongues uh, more than anything else. He equates it with in the spirit. Yeah, he's, he almost interchanges the terminology of speaking in tongues, praying in tongues, praying in the spirit, singing in tongues, singing in the spirit. They're sort of interchangeable. And as Jan just, um, just really sort of shared with us, she came to the gift of tongues, or the gift of tongues came to her at a time when she was reaching out to say, how do I pray? And that somehow my words aren't sufficient. And, uh, you know, that, um, that God gives us a way of being able to pray from deep inside us, pray with a depth and an intimacy with him in words that uh, go beyond the language that we can express with our mind and that there can be a power in being able to pray in this extra deep way. When I think about the, was thinking about this picture of where do these gifts fit? I think about the picture of a, a ship heading across the ocean. And sometimes you see a beautiful ship, beautifully made, shiny and polished. And it's going through the waves and the waves, the sea is moving aside. The ship goes through the ocean and you see a beautiful ship but the ship wouldn't be going anywhere without an engine room and without an engine and down underneath the deck underneath deck out the side is the engine room and in old-fashioned uh, steam ships there were people shoveling steam into the uh, into the boiler at a rate of knots to keep the engine running the ship was totally dependent on the on being the power coming from the engine room within and um, Jan's just going to unshare the screen for us now so that the text in front will disappear. Um, yeah so they're dependent on the power from the engine room to move the ship forward and in the, day, the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues are gifts that fit in in the engine room of the church of enabling us to pray more deeply to understand the things of God more deeply and out of that, the church is empowered and empowered to make an impact in, in the world. So God wants to deepen that experience of prayer and the gift of tongues can really help us in that. 
It's not something that you can tell somebody how to do, but uh, as Jan described, something that started with a few words and uh, asking the Holy Spirit for, for this as a way of, of being able to pray when she didn't know how to pray. I think some of us are more mindy than others and some of us are, are more comfortable with our own words than others and uh, maybe we might feel less need than other people, I don't know. But uh, the gift of tongues being a powerful way of communicating and praying in the spirit. Um, the other gift that's there is the gift of interpretation of tongues. And um, Paul is really clear to say that our worship time shouldn't get to the place where it's just people speaking in tongues because nobody would be able to understand what is going on. Now, it's interesting when you look at this model of worship in 1 Corinthians and um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 sets out this model of worship where he said, Paul says, what should we say then, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. And it's always amazed me that people think of this about being somewhere that you go on a Sunday morning and there's a worship service. Amazing that in all of the um, New Testament, of all the topics that are written about at length, there's only one chapter that talks about the format of a worship service. Yeah, all the rest of the New Testament is talking about our life, the way that we live in the world, um, about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, it's talking about our love for one another, it's talking about living a, a, a holy life. There's almost no instruction on how to run a worship service except for this one chapter. So that's interesting if you think about uh, the, the, the way we think of church sometimes as being defined by a worship service. New Testament really defines church by a lifestyle and a community. And that this one picture that we have of a worship service in 1 Corinthians 14 is a very interactive prayer. And when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he wrote to a church that was clearly grappling with everything happening in almost to excess, yeah? and uh, their meetings have become very disordered. You can tell he's dealing with a situation where everybody's talking at once. They didn't have a PA, they couldn't give somebody a microphone to say they were talking. So they were going to a meeting and all sorts of things are happening. Everyone's talking at once. Nobody knows what's going on. People are fighting to get in and have their chance to, to speak. So there's a huge amount of enthusiasm and energy happening in these meetings, but it's very disordered. Yeah? And Paul is writing, giving them a structure for how they can bring this into order. And what he doesn't do is say, change your meeting so that somebody speaks and everybody else listens all the time. That isn't what he does. He sets out a protocol for them being able to continue with a meeting where everybody participates, but with an order to it. And so he says, Two or three people should speak. They should, uh, they should speak in turn. When somebody else is ready to speak, then the other one should sit, should sit down and, um, and so on. So he, he sets about an order, which is really an order. It's just an outworking of submitting to one another, of respecting one another, and honoring one another in the meeting. And similarly, um, it seems that he's dealing with a situation where they have meetings where sort of situation that Jan described of everybody singing in tongues or everybody praying in tongues is going on for a long time. There's nothing that would be meaningful to anybody coming in from the outside. There's nothing that would be a clear communication of what is happening. And Paul's saying that isn't right. That makes your meetings hostile to the outsider. It makes it somewhere that's only friendly and welcoming to people who want to come and sing and pray in tongues. That your meetings need to be more than that. Things need to be made clear to, to, to the unbeliever and to the outsider. So we shouldn't be dominated by this. Now, he's not saying that there shouldn't be tongues in a public meeting. If he was saying that, there wouldn't be any place for the gift of interpretation of tongues, because the gift of interpretation of tongues is bringing an explanation back in English of what it is that's being said. 
Now, the way Paul describes tongues here, he's describing them as our spiritual language to the Lord. Now, I've been in meetings when um, somebody's spoken in tongues and then somebody has brought an interpretation and the interpretation has come as God speaking to me. And I remember in some teaching in this, someone pointing out, well, that can't be quite right because if tongues is us speaking to the Lord, then the interpretation should be us speaking to the Lord as well. Now, um, I've only uh, on one or two occasions been somebody who has felt moved to speak in tongues in a public meeting. That's only been once or twice and quite exceptional for me. And I would say that uh, the gift of tongues isn't something that uh, I'm uh, either very gifted with or I'm not a I'm not um, a, a great user of it, but on several occasions I've been in the place, or lots of occasions, in the place where I've really felt I've been given the interpretation of tongues. And in a meeting where a tongue has been brought and there isn't an interpretation, I've very often been the person to bring the interpretation. And the interpretation isn't a translation, it's not like one speaking the word from one thing to another. A better analogy, and um, forgive me, uh, I know we've got speech and language therapists and people who know things like sign language much better than, than I do. But it'd probably be better to think of translating from, um, from spoken word to sign language, where you find a way to explain what it is the person is saying. You're not just finding different things, you're finding a way to explain what is being said in a different style of language. And in the interpretation of tongues, God gives something that is getting the gist of what's being prayed into English for, in that way. And I, in, in my experience, sometimes that can happen that when people have been singing in tongues, singing in the spirit for some time, that somebody gets a song in English that captures the, the heart of what's being prayed and sung in tongues. And so it's an interesting gift. And when people sit and rationalize it, they say, well, why do we want this? Well, John talked about going on the March for Jesus. She talked about going on the March for Jesus in rugby. The week after, sorry, the year after we went on the March for Jesus in rugby, um, they decided not to do it in towns as small as rugby and to concentrate on having bigger marches in a fewer places. So the next year we were asked to go over to Coventry and join in the March for Jesus in Coventry. So on this occasion now there were, so I think a couple of thousand Christians came together to, to march in Coventry. And um, there was a lot of time spent preparing in worship beforehand. And as people went around, some of the time we were singing, and other times um, people were praying and there were people praying and praying in tongues during the course of the march. At the end of the, 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 the march, we finished and we went back. And in some ways you think, well, we went out, people saw us, they saw the name of Jesus being proclaimed. The, uh, I understand that later the Bishop of Coventry, who was on the march, heard from Coventry police that there wasn't any crime reported in Coventry that afternoon that normally on a, a Saturday afternoon in a city, there would be lots of different crimes taking place, but that afternoon, no crime took place. And you ask, what were we doing? I really believe that that march moved something in the, in the spiritual realms. And uh, we forget sometimes that we're in a spiritual battle. And these gifts, especially the gifts of tongues and interpretation, are here as um, equipment for us in a spiritual battle and um, we are in a place where we're in a spiritual battle today um, if you look around us we're in a world which is increasingly secularized it's increasingly less common for people to be going to church on Sunday and that situation arises because people's eyes are blinded to the truth of Jesus and to the need for a savior and uh, we as as, as God's people, we need to be empowered spiritually. Um, it, it really, uh, just thinking about the day of Pentecost and what happened on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, there was this massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit. People came to Christ and the church was effectively established in Jerusalem. And in the days that followed, 
people saw the Christians and saw how much they loved one another and they were held and honoured. It was said of Christians, see these Christians, how they love one another. And out of their love for one another, then they, their love came out into the community around. Now, many places, it's very difficult people to see Christians and to see how they love one another. People are dispersed around the place. But it's really struck me over recent weeks as we've been meeting, strangely, most people from the village of Yalbertov, but meeting online um, with our communications going over all over the world to get between each other. It really struck me the extent to which we as a community of believers in Yalbertov can be a visible community. We can be seen to be people who love one another and care for one another. We can be seen to be people who love or and care for the people outside. And that that comes from the Holy Spirit working within us for us being concerned, for us being genuinely caring. And whatever it means organisationally in terms of church, that we want the Holy Spirit to move among us more and more. And these gifts are important in that it's clear that they were part of the life of the early church and intended to be an ongoing part of the life of the early church. So I'm not, um, I heard a Pentecostal preacher saying, oh, you must be speaking in tongues and people get left feeling if they're not speaking in tongues, then they're some kind of inferior believer. I'm absolutely not saying that. Um, what I'm saying is, this is a gift. And the passage that we read said, God gives his gifts to different people. He doesn't give everybody every gift. They're not badges of honours. They're not reward for righteousness. But this is a gift that we should just be open to say, if we're to be asking the Lord for, in terms of a gift that deepens, the gift of tongues deepening our spiritual life. And as the gift of tongues is used and is used in a public setting, we then also need the gift of interpretation to bear with it. It has no gift of interpretation. It's not going to be used at all without the gift of tongues. But the gift of interpretation being there to, to make um, tongues really something that can be part of corporate worship. You know, it's interesting if you look at what's happening in the church at the world at the moment, the way in which over in a way, the last hundred years, there's been a fresh thirst for these gifts of the Spirit. And the way in which the parts of the church that have been moving in the gifts of the Spirit have grown around the world. And um, I don't know whether you uh, know, as we think about Pentecost Sunday, but I, ha I have... I understand from very reliable sources that there are more people regularly attend Pentecostal churches in Italy than regularly attend Roman Catholic churches. So there are more members in Roman Catholic churches, but there are people who go at set places, but there are more people regularly attending Roman Catholic churches. Attendance is higher at Pentecostal churches than it is at Roman Catholic churches in Italy. If you look across India, if you look across Africa, if you look across South America, Churches um, with a Pentecostal ethos or charismatic churches, and by charismatic churches, we tend to mean churches that are part of um, other denominations, um, but open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And there are lots of Anglican churches like that. There are lots of Baptist churches like that. There are lots of um, um, churches and there are congregational churches in, in that shape, you tend to see that those are the growing churches. This isn't just something so that we can have a, a, that, that we can have a nicer time and be seen as being more spiritual by, by, compared with other churches. The empowerment of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is really important in seeing churches prosper and grow and thrive and really touch the world in which we live. And so as we in this strange situation, as we draw closer to the day of Pentecost, let's really be asking God to pour out more of his Holy Spirit in whichever way he chooses. As we said, all of these are the work of one and the same Spirit and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So we're not going to be comparing and saying, oh, they're one of these and they're one of that. We're not going to be trying to be super spiritual but genuinely seeking to be open to having the gifts of the Holy Spirit and through those gifts 
ministering to others, ministering to others in all sorts of ways, but especially today thinking about the gift of tongues, especially in a depth of prayer and a deepening of our prayer and worship life and a deepening of the revelation of Jesus through our prayer and worship life. Lord, we ask that you might do with this with us in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we're going to move on to another song. Can you share the screen, Jan? This is a song that um, the big one. This is a song that we uh, we found this week, actually, looking around for Holy Spirit related songs we'd known before. Perhaps if we can move on. And um, although it's actually quite an old song, written back in two thousand and five by Keith Getty and Stuart Townend, who were responsible uh, under the Holy Spirit for an amazing richness of songs that have come to the church in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, amazing the way that God has given um, people actually in this group of churches so many new songs with really great meeting as well as lovely tunes. So um, Johnny and Domitia very kindly put this one together for us and we're going to, to sing it now. Michael, can you hear me? I can now, yes, sorry. Thank you. Okay. So just before Michael uh, leads us in prayer, just that um, last um, 
real prayer from that song that in unity the face of Christ may be seen for all, by all. I can't remember the exact words. It was up in front of us a minute ago, but that just that thought really captured me that in unity the face of Christ can be seen by others. Michael, please go ahead and lead us in prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Lord, whose son Jesus Christ suffered and understood people's fears and pains before they spoke of them. We pray for those in hospital receiving treatment at this current time. Surround the frightened with your tenderness. Give strength to those in pain. Hold the weak in your arms and give hope to those recovering. We think of those in our own community, especially Alan and Margie, Elaine and Margaret and the Gamble family. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? I'll, un I'll unmute everyone for this. We won't understand each other very well, but we'll really get that sense of praying together. Our Father, Father in heaven, 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 both be thy name. Thy kingdom, 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 thy king